Good evening. Uh, I'm Alexander Rosen, the Executive Director here at the Long Now Foundation. Uh, as some of you might have already noticed, we have, uh, after, what is it now, 12 years, changed our membership structure just a little bit. We have changed it so that new people who sign up, uh, you have to sign up for a $12 level in order to get the tickets to events like tonight. But all of you people who have been uh, our great members, how long, how many people here are members? Thank you, all of you. Uh, our grandfathered in on the old system, but we are asking anyone who can to voluntarily move to that level so that we can afford great venues like this one. Um, which, as some of you have been in San Francisco for the last 12 years, the costs have gone up a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, so we want to be able to keep up with that, and we appreciate it. If you are able to, to move to that level, uh, it would be uh, really, really helpful for us to keep doing great things. I am Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. You can tell when I sort of like a book. There's more dog ears here than pages, practically. Um, and this book is out in the lobby. So the Long Now Foundation has been looking into, at least be spending a couple of years looking into what makes some institutions very long-lived. And one of the first things that emerges is that companies come and go. Cities are basically immortal. Dynasties come and go, and cities are basically immortal. Whole nations come and go, and cities are basically immortal. What's going on? A person who has really delved deeply, in both respects, into the timelessness of cities is a time traveler, an archaeologist, Monica Smith. Thank you for the warm welcome and for the opportunity to be here in San Francisco, one of the great cities of the Pacific Rim, the gateway to the Pacific Rim, along with, of course, many other gateways to the Pacific Rim. So there's Anchorage, there's San Diego, there's Tokyo, there's Melbourne, there's Sydney, there's Hong Kong, there's Honolulu, there's Lima, and of course there's Los Angeles, where I come from as well. And in all of those places, people celebrate the places that they're in because cities offer to us something that you really can't get anyplace else. And when we think of cities, we think about all of the things that we can find there, including these kinds of entertainment venues like what we find ourselves in this evening. And of course, there are many other things that make cities attractive, those bright lights that are part of the big city, the opportunities for exotic cuisine, the opportunities for unique kinds of monumental architecture, uh, the nightlife, the kinds of entertainment that you can only get when you have those massive city populations, uh, places like sports arenas and other kinds of venues. The opportunity for information and the opportunity to get just about any kind of thing you could possibly want. Oh yes, there's those other things too. But those are the things that we tend to willingly overlook when we think about cities and when we have that kind of love-hate relationship that we have with the people around us. We are willing to overlook the pollution, the crowdedness, the high rents of all of the cities that we know and love because we get something out of them that we really could not imagine in any other scenario. And cities are also not only numerous, but growing. There are more than 4,000 cities in the world, settlements with more than 100,000 people each. And the number of cities is growing, and the cities themselves are also getting larger. So there is no such thing as a city that has stopped growing. In fact, that's one of the things about cities that is perpetually under construction, perpetually dynamic, perpetually under renovation and growing. And some of the cities that we have in our world today are enormous. But there is no sign outside of Tokyo that says, sorry, we're full. <laughs> 
There is no sign outside of San Francisco that says, sorry, we're full. There is no sign outside of Mexico City that says, sorry, we're full. And in all of those places, what we have are people who are coming into cities and living among strangers. If there's anything that's the hallmark of the giant population centers that we have in the world today, it's the fact that you are living amongst people that you probably will never see again as you pass them on the sidewalk. Think about the audience that you're in this evening. How many people do you know in this room? Maybe one, two, a handful? Maybe nobody, but here you are. So with all of these cities in the world, you might think that they are perhaps the natural habitat of our species. But I can tell you that nothing is further from the truth. The earliest cities started only about 6,000 years ago. What seems like a long time, but is really just the blink of an eye in the long history of our species. For the last 100,000 or more years, we have been the same Homo sapiens but we have not lived in cities. The things that we had with us as a species are things that made it possible for us to eventually combine ourselves into these giant configurations. So, what are the building blocks of urbanism? What is it that we had in the long makeup of our species that made it possible for us to live willingly among strangers to do very illogical things, like be away from our food supply. Where is your next meal coming from? You don't really know, but you trust that it will be there when you want it. Where does the restaurant get its food? You don't know, and you don't care. That is one of the things that urbanism has flipped the switch on that makes it both illogical and amazing. The building blocks of urbanism are things that started many, many tens of thousands of years ago. One of them in particular is language, the possibility of speaking, not only to communicate information, but also to think about things that are not there, like the past and the future, both of which are entirely imaginary constructs but for which we have the language to be able to envision something that is not there. Even more important is the opportunity to put in a conditional tense, not just a past, present, and a future, but a what if. If we build it, they will come. That kind of planning is something that was absolutely essential, not only to our long human survival, but to the eventual possibility of living in larger and larger configurations of strangers. Another thing that humans are very good about is dealing with objects. We're the only species that has stuff, and certainly has so much stuff, and we have been trying to invent new things since the very beginning. The first artifacts of any detailed aesthetic consequence were from about a million and a half years ago. And those artifacts were made in quantities that suggested that mere utility was not enough as part of the human composition of making the world around them, of making tools, for example. The first artifacts were things called hand axes, and they look a little bit like the two palms of your hand put together. And we'd have a hard time making one even today with our sophisticated technical skills, because it requires a certain amount of imagination to turn a stone over and over again and manufacture them without hurting yourself. And the amount of work that goes into these objects is far beyond what would be required to make a useful, sharp-edged tool. In fact, there's been some interesting thought about the way that people manufactured those hand axes, not only to be something useful, but to be a kind of social calling card. Hey, baby, look at my hand axe. <laughs> Another thing that's really important for humans and that has been part of our makeup for a long time has been migration. So more than a million years ago, our ancestors walked out of Africa and into every corner of the old world. That process of walking is still there. 
Migration is not a new phenomenon, it's a human phenomenon. And the last thing that humans do that became a precursor for the kinds of things we needed to become urban is the development of architecture, of not just accepting the world as it is, of being able to find a shelter under a tree or in a cave, but to actually make structures that suit people, not only for shelter, but also as a kind of social calling card, as a way of putting together a household and making it visible to the rest of the people around. So those are the things that are the kind of building blocks of what it took to be able to be urban. But many of those things were done for tens of thousands of years before people actually became an urban species. And the first move towards getting people into larger and larger groups was probably something that was a ritual impetus. The idea of coming together and gathering with a bunch of strangers was something that is evident in the earliest physical ritual structures that we have in the world today. So you see here Stonehenge, which of course is very familiar to us and very picturesque and evocative. And then you also have Gebekli Tepe, which is probably the world's earliest ritual structure in Turkey, uh, made by hunter-gatherers who were coming together and constructing these upright stone circles over and over again to be able to make a place for people to come together and have a ritual. And we know archeologically that these are places where people came repeatedly over and over again. They came, they had celebrations, they had fires, they did cooking, they interred their dead. And all of that was very exciting, including probably also people coming along with trinkets to sell, or also you know, people coming along for a little romance, you know, down in the village where there were only 50 or 60 people at any given time. Marriage prospects were probably rather limited. So the idea of going to a ritual event um, you know, was something like a festival atmosphere so that you could have a little shopping, a little ritual, a little romance all at the same time. But there was kind of a catch about these ritual centers, and that is that after you were done with the ritual, you were supposed to go home. So when we think about places like Stonehenge, we think about places like Gebekli Tepe, there are still no cities anywhere near them. So it took something more in order to be able to get people to live in a place that was kind of like a permanent festival atmosphere. And once that started, once you had a kind of economy of people living together, of all kinds of new opportunities for romance, for education, for medical care, that's when the first cities got going. In order to find out about those cities archaeologically, what we can do is examine the archaeological record to see what it is that we find from those very first cities 6,000 years ago. But speaking as an archaeologist, I can tell you that that process is not so easy. The investigation of ancient Mesopotamian cities, of ancient Egyptian cities, is something that has gone on for the last two or three hundred years. And many times, cities are incredibly obvious in the landscape. So here you see uh, a fanciful engraving on the rediscovery of the city of Ur and the, the giant ziggurat that is there. And so even though you might think of archaeology as something where we always have to dig, that's not necessarily the case. Many of those ancient cities never went away, and they are still right there where our ancestors left them. But when we do dig, what we find is that that constant layering of time results in an obscurity of the very beginnings of those oldest cities. And so trying to ask the question, 
what happened here first is actually very difficult for archaeologists because we have to dig through these layers and layers of archaeological habitation. And if you can imagine being an archaeologist in a city the size of San Francisco or even downtown San Francisco, uh, you can imagine that doing an excavation of an area which might be you know, half the size of this room or the size of an, of an Olympic swimming pool that would take your team an entire season to excavate, you can see that what we actually know about ancient cities is really rather limited. It's limited by the area that we can excavate, but it's also limited by that great depth that goes all the way down to the bottom, where the very beginnings of urbanism would lie. However, we persist, and in our excavations, what we try to do is we try to evaluate what it would have been like to be in a living city, whether or not we have historical documents that can also shed some light on that process, or whether or not we have other cities nearby that are potentially linked that as we work on one urban settlement, such as the Indian side of Shishpalgar, where I've been working with my colleagues for a number of years, as you can see here in these images, or whether we are working in other places out in the hinterlands to try to understand how these urban centers pull together their vast networks. Because even in ancient times, cities were always networks. There's no such thing as a single city that popped up in the middle of nowhere and was all by its lonesome for a long time. Cities always were in necklaces of other cities, just like we think about the Pacific Rim being all of these interconnected urban settlements in which the urbanism really supersedes the national and state boundaries in which these globalized cities find themselves. Even when we excavate and even when we expose the architecture of the uppermost levels for people to see, it can still result in a certain puzzlement about exactly how these things come together. So if you've visited Rome, for example, or if you've visited Pompeii, which is the image that you see here, uh, you can feel rather bad that you're walking around all of these ancient uh, constructions and you feel a little confused. Like you, you feel bad that maybe you should have read the guidebook better, uh, or, or you should have listened to the guide more who was going on and on, but it's very hot, you, know, you haven't been able to throw it. Don't feel bad. Archaeologists are also confused. <laughs> because all of those layers of habitation were the result of people actively modifying their city as they were living in it. They're exactly the same way that we do today. So we are also trying to piece together this three-dimensional puzzle of the past to understand what it was that ancient people were engaged with and what they were experiencing in the ancient past. But now, fortunately, technology does sometimes come to our assistance and we can start to reconstruct what it is that's happening in these ancient cities in ways that make it more compelling for visitors, but that also help to remind us as archaeologists what it is that ancient people were living amongst. They were not living amongst bits and pieces of broken architecture. They were trying to make their cities whole and vibrant and dynamic, just like we do today. So what I'd like to do is to think about the ways in which there are three components of urbanism that link the past and the present. The real building blocks of urbanism are primarily people, places, and the resultant possibilities. Even though we might think that the cities of the ancient world and the cities of today must have been so very different because we have electricity and they didn't, and we have BART and they didn't. <laughs> what I can say is that in those categories of people, places, and possibilities, modern and ancient cities were exactly the same. So there are a number of ways that we can sort of peel back those layers of time and think about how urban continuities, how the idea of being an urban animal is something that is now with us and is going to be with us forever, or at least the next 10,000 years. <laughs> 
So what, are, what do modern and ancient cities have in common? First of all, there's monumental architecture, that sense of people building things that are much greater than what any particular family would need or what any community would need for any kind of temporary purpose. What we have is monumental architecture that is often functional, sometimes entirely symbolic, like Coit Tower or the Eiffel Tower or any of those other kinds of towers, but it's the capacity to make and imagine large-scale structures that really links the past and the present. Another thing that cities have in common all over the world are divisions of labor. So even though we often think about Adam Smith and the wealth of nations as describing how it is that we can have more efficient production processes by dividing labor and having people specialize in tasks, this is something that smart managers knew 6,000 years ago as well. We can see in the Roman world that there were firings of kilns to produce ceramic vessels 20 to 25,000 pieces at a time. So this massive quantities of production and consumption and also discard is something that we can clearly see in every urban settlement, past or present. Another thing that we get in both modern and ancient cities are the diverse economies that characterize the migrations of people coming in and the specialties of different kinds of activities that people are willing to take a chance on. A long time ago, the archaeologist V. Gordon Child talked about how being in a city was a godsend for somebody who was manufacturing something like metal tools that farmers might need only once or twice a year. So they couldn't keep somebody like that in a village. They had to have this itinerant way of life until cities came up and made it possible for somebody to produce something very utilitarian or even very esoteric and be able to have customers every single day coming to them. So this is why cities are places of innovation. And when you think about Fashion Week, Fashion Week is always in a city. When you think about tech innovations, they're almost always in cities. So that that large number of producers is met by a large number of consumers. We also get urban planning as something that we find in every urban settlement, past and present. And oftentimes, archaeologists have looked only at kind of the downtown areas of ancient settlements, where that sense of planning is the most regularized. We're only now starting to look at some of the outlying areas where planning is often uh, escaped by the people who live in them. So suburban areas and slum areas of ancient cities are places where we can see that the urban planning ethos is not quite reached, just as we have the same concerns for our own growing cities, both here in the US and in other places as well. We get extensive hinterlands so that the products that come into urban settlements might come from an enormous distance. And yet, as a consumer, you know that when you go to a market, you will be able to find what you need, whether it's an apple from Belgium or an apple from New Zealand or an apple from Shasta County. You know, as a consumer, all these pathways of transportation bring things to you that you want and need from that diverse and often distant hinterland. And finally, it's the social networks that make it possible for people in cities to interact, to interact with their neighbors, to interact with their friends, and also, very importantly, to interact with strangers. So now let's take a look at each one of those things about the people, the places, and the possibilities, and how it is that those in both modern and ancient cities were able to come together and exercise the kinds of dynamic opportunities that they were seeking that could be found in no other configuration of people other than urbanism. One of the things that we have is people coming into cities for religious purposes, as well as for many other kinds of activities. Now, you might remember that when we talked about early ritual, like Stonehenge or Gebekli Tepe, that those were only meant to be temporary. It doesn't mean that cities are without religion. 
In fact, it's one of the things that I think continually surprises us about modern religious movements, is that we expect cities to be secular, but they are not. You can check this for yourself the next time you walk down the street and look for all the religious establishments that you are customarily kind of overlooking, um, you know, right down to the Jehovah's Witnesses on the corner um, who are bringing a sort of portable religion to the process of urbanism. But of course, there are many other things that happen in cities as well when it comes to people. And people come to cities not only for a kind of pilgrimage, but also for education. They come for entertainment. They come for medical care. When we think about the cutting edge places of medical innovation, we think about cities, because cities are not only the places where there is a big enough population that some disease will eventually show up, unfortunately, um, it's also where you get the greatest number of medical practitioners. And of course, people come for employment. And this is a huge draw for cities, you know, despite the high rents and other kinds of disadvantages. The reason that people come into cities, particularly young people, is for these opportunities of employment. And oftentimes when we think about employment, we're thinking about these kinds of jobs. We're thinking about white collar work, we're thinking about office work, we're thinking about tech work, especially here in the Bay Area. But we should also remember that the vast majority of work that's to be had in urban centers is this kind of work. It's the kind of work that people have, that they can do, even if they have no land in the countryside, if they have no skills and no education. And this is where a big proportion of urban migration is happening, not only here in the US, but in other parts of the world as well, where you've got people who are coming in to be laborers, to build things, to clean things, to move things, to deal with food service. And that is also something that we can see going back to the very earliest cities where takeout food was part and parcel of urban life right from the very beginning. All of those interactions among people are, of course, done in physical places. And the places of cities are things that kind of lock us into streams of transportation, of pathways, of movement, of interaction, but also of regular occasions of meeting people, whether it's your favorite barista at the local coffee place, all of those other opportunities to not be a stranger in the city that you're living in. And in ancient times as well, the sense of making places is something that was critical to the integration of people, but also to the well-being of each and every individual. When we think about those settlement dynamics, we shouldn't be thinking of big anonymous groups, but we should be thinking about actual people moving from one place to another in the course of their everyday lives and building things that were important to them. We can take an example of some of the many religious edifices that we see in ancient Mesopotamian cities, uh, such as the city of Eridu, where you had the beginnings of the city was also the beginnings of anchoring people through, in Mesopotamia particularly, religious activities. And so at the very bottom, you can imagine there's long, deep trenches of excavations that would take years to get down to the bottom of the beginnings of the cities. And the beginning of the temple was very modest. It was something that just had a few walls, uh, an altar, an offering table. And then as the city became more prosperous, as the donors became more prosperous, then you would have growth. So we see a slightly later temple, also at the side of Eridu, where you have the same basic necessary components. You've got the offering table, you've got the altar, but then you start to have many, many other kinds of configurations. You have rooms for the priestesses and priests, and then you have rooms where you can store things and so on. And then, as the city becomes quite wealthy, as the population base increases for devotions to the temple, then you start to get very elaborate structures. It's another way in which we can see that 
dynamism of early cities and the fact that they don't stand still, that they are constantly under renovation, under aggrandizement and under investment in ways that are, of course, very familiar to us today as well. When we look at how all of those pieces are put together, such as this case, uh, the site of Sabratha, a Roman site in Libya, you can see how some of those really big monumental structures, like the giant half-moon amphitheater that you see here, are then surrounded by places of urban planning where you've got a kind of a downtown where you have monumental architecture, public buildings, private spaces, and then connectivity that all goes through those long, straight roads where you get a, a clear line of sight from one area of residence to the next. And this is a kind of a, a typical archaeological excavation where you can see, you know, after many, many years of research, that the main portions of the site have been exposed and we can get a sense of what the downtown was like. It's much less common to have archaeologists also look at the surrounding areas, the kind of the raggedy bits and the slums and empty spaces of ancient settlements because we just quite you know, haven't gotten there yet. And also, when you think about, you know, empty spaces, it would be a little odd uh, to write a grant to say that you're not going to dig a temple or a tomb or a fancy house, but you want to go and dig an empty space. That hasn't quite happened yet. I think more typical is this very unusual uh, excavation of the site of Ur, also in Iraq, where here you can really see this kind of dense neighborhood kinds of interaction where the streets are not straight, where you've got houses that are all abutting one another. And you can imagine neighbors and dogs and noise and cooking odors wafting through in ways that really made neighborhoods out of these places that we excavate and find the foundations of buildings, if we imagine how it is that people interacted in those spaces, it means that people are trying to live their lives and change their surroundings in order to suit the configurations that they had of their growing families or perhaps of their shrinking families over time. And there are a couple of places in Mesopotamia where there have been excavations of these kinds of household areas where we also have some written documents from the very same households. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth Stone has done some work uh, actually sort of comparing the wall lines with the documents to show how it is that these households have changed over time in exactly the same way that the big monumental architecture architecture has also changed. And that sense of architecture, of placemaking, and yet also being in the same place is something that I think is very nicely summed up in the work of Jeremy Till, who's an architectural critic and architect himself, who has written very evocatively about how it is that when we make something new in a city, we have to do it within the footprint of something that is already there. He talks about the way that architecture is dependent on others at every stage of its journey, from initial sketch to inhabitation. And you can actually see it when you go out in San Francisco or New York or Sydney or any of your other favorite cities in the world and see how it is that a place gets removed and something else gets reimagined and put in, but it has to be in exactly that same space. That's true not only of modern cities, but ancient ones as well. So this is my picture of Rome, in which in that forum, in that confusing forum, there's been this kind of stacking up of architecture that just keeps getting added on to right up to the 20th century. So all of those things come together to be possibilities. Because if a city is never finished, then there's hope for making things better than what we inherited. One of the most powerful places in cities is not just the monumental architecture, but is the empty spaces, those places that archaeologists are sort of hesitant to write grants to dig. Because empty spaces are extremely flexible. <laughs> 
You know, you can have a space that is ostensibly for one purpose, like transportation, become on other occasions something altogether different, like a street that turns into a farmer's market, or a plaza that turns into a ceremonial ground, or an airport that becomes the site of a demonstration. That repurposing of spaces, of making empty spaces, places for that continual dynamism of the city, but on a moment's notice, is something that we also see both in historical and ancient examples. So that you have the built architecture that we find archaeologically, and then you have these open spaces for which our imaginations and sometimes the historical record also give us a glimpse of the activities that are there. So in southern India, a couple thousand years ago, there's some wonderful poetry about what's happening in the streets, that the elephants are going through and clanging their chains, and the young women are wearing their bangles, and there's this fragrant scent of rice that is permeating the air. So that it's these open spaces that really help to convey that dynamism of cities, both past and present. Then there's infrastructure. The idea that not everything that is made is something ceremonial or personal. Sometimes it's practical. And one of the most amazing things about cities is the amount and extent of infrastructure that is necessary in order to make it functional. So underneath our feet are all of the pipes and conduits for both fresh water and dirty water, exactly the same kinds of separation of water that we see in Harappan cities 4,000 years ago, that we see in Japanese cities 1,000 years ago. The idea that there has to be something, of what my colleague has called an armature of the city, to be able to enable the city to function. And it's that infrastructure that's underfoot that also gives the city an opportunity to talk about, to imagine, to envision, to use that if-then linguistic construction that if we build it this way, a certain kind of thing will happen. So that is our transportation infrastructure, that is our reimagining of highways, uh, railways turning into pathways, it's the idea that a fixed location, a kind of architectural dependency, does not mean that we stop imagining how things could be made better. In cities, there is always Mother Nature as well. So our infrastructure is not just according to our wishes of what we think should happen to the armature of the city, but also the things that we have to deal with that Mother Nature has always been there for. So things like floods and earthquakes and other kinds of natural phenomena are always part of cities as well. And in the archaeological record of ancient China in particular, we can see this tremendous attention to detail in which there are records of flooding over the last 2,000 years in which practically every year there's a flood. So urban planners and urban managers have used infrastructure not only to imagine possibilities of connecting through things like bridges, but also the necessity of managing against the kinds of sometimes unwanted natural phenomena that are also part of cities. And so that's also contributing to the dynamism of cities, the idea that you've got a perpetual need to upgrade and maintain. So whether it's Suzhou or modern London, the idea of the natural world is always there. But it's hard to get people excited about infrastructure because infrastructure requires maintenance and people definitely don't like maintenance. As humans, we are historically biased against maintenance. And yet, that's exactly what infrastructure needs and is something that is always part of the dialogue of infrastructure, that when we need to build new things, we can't just think about building the new thing, but also maintaining the thing that we've already got. And I think we have to get used to the idea that maintenance is 
not only as expensive as new architecture, it's probably more expensive. So can we get people to be more excited about infrastructure? Yeah. <laughs> it happened in Paris in the 19th century. When the Paris sewers were put in, they were a focus of public commentary and you know, a desire to experience something that was, at the time, altogether new. And so you, know, you actually had people taking tours of the infrastructure and being very excited about it. So maybe it's just a question of rebranding, right? <laughs> maybe we shouldn't think about this as you know, infrastructure or the Paris sewers. We just call it the tunnel of love. <laughs> and that's proof that maybe we can be excited about infrastructure. Sure we can. So that not only has this become a symbol of the city, but it's something that undergoes a very willing form of maintenance. So somewhere between five to 10,000 gallons of paint a year, and 30 painters are dedicated to keeping the Golden Gate Bridge golden. And infrastructure is also a way for public officials to perform visibility. So this is a street in Tokyo uh, where a very minor repair seems to require a great deal of performativity, including uniforms and you know, somebody at attention. So it's not just about the thing that's being maintained or repaired, but a demonstration of good governance, that somebody is paying attention to this infrastructure. The same thing is true of those kinds of cleaners and street sweepers that are often supported not only by individual cities, but also by business improvement districts, and so that you have various parts of cities, you know, not only here in San Francisco, but in practically every major city of the world now, you have people in a uniform of the business district of that portion of the city very visibly engaging in things like maintenance. Infrastructure is also a way of advising people, of recommending, of codifying the language of the social networks in a way that suggests something that is both you know, good for your health, but also that somebody is kind of watching over the process, that it's not just a free-for-all of connectivity, but a certain structured way of movement that is actually meant to help things work better. So, People who are parking engineers are constantly tinkering with the idea of how to make city streets flow better, how to make traffic move more efficiently, or adding or taking away bus lanes and bike lanes and so on, and at the same time putting in some instructions for you, the end user, um, so that you have to go and uh, look very carefully at all of the different thou shalt nots um, whenever it is that you're trying to park someplace, or giving you helpful instructions about how to cross a street, or even using the most basic infrastructure as a kind of branding. Oh, that can't be right. Everybody knows that LA doesn't have any water. <laughs> there we go. So that sense of the built environment, no matter how small, or the thing that you pass that you tread underfoot, is part of that urban sense of belonging that helps to link us all as strangers, that helps to make urban centers thrive, that each individual can contribute to. And nowhere is that more evident than under circumstances where people work together in order to overcome something that Mother Nature or other people have done to interrupt the life of the city. And that hashtag, your name of city here strong, is something that we're starting to see over and over and over again. And it's actually being thought of by people as a way of making a commitment to their neighbors in a spontaneous way at times of need. That sense of spontaneous collectivity is now being brought into the community in a more organized level, not just to respond to disasters when they occur, but to proactively become engaged in being ready for the next one. 
So this is what we have in Los Angeles now. This is a website and a whole concept uh, with the acronym RYLAN, Ready Your LA Neighborhood. And it's very clear on the website the kind of necessity of preparation for all of us, not only for ourselves, but for each other. That disasters can overwhelm the capacity of 911. And that neighbors, those people you used to call strangers, become your best source of help. I want to close this part of the conversation by going to two quotes that I think exemplify this sense of dynamic community, the sense of continuity that we see in cities, the way in which, having started cities about 6,000 years ago, there is no way we can go back. With all of their deficits, cities are the best places for human communities to be able to move forward with the things that we want out of life. The first quote is from Stuart Brand. <laughs> And this sense of promise, but also fidelity and commitment, is something that comes through in these words. A realm of intimate personal power is developing. Power of the individual to conduct their own education, find their own inspiration, shape their own environment, and share their adventure with whoever is interested. The next quote is in homage to the wonderful venue that we find ourselves in this evening, the San Francisco Jazz Center. The most important thing is the spirit of jazz, which is about freedom, about improvisation, about courage. I think if we substitute the word cities for the word jazz, then I think my job here this evening is done. Thank you. It's interested to see at the, uh, at the beginning of the acknowledgments of your book, you began by saying uh, you were surprised by how much fun this book was to write. Uh, what's that about? You know, as a writer, if I don't write every day, I get grouchy, actually. Mm -hmm. um, a day without writing would be like a day without breathing. And there is something amazing about the way that words work. They are the most powerful tool that humans have. And the idea of being able to put together and describe what it's like to be on an archaeological site or to run a dig or to work with students and then be able to put that on a page, how could that not be fun? Mm -hmm. So we got a question from Linda. Morris uh, saying there's cities that are losing population, like Detroit. And uh, Peter Schwartz mentions here that he grew up in Camden, New Jersey, which is a city that has uh, been at times half dead. And there's the Chinese cities, the so-called ghost cities, they're built basically without people, at least for quite a while. Um, cities without people, what happens there? So the Chinese cities case is actually quite interesting because um, many of the metropolitan areas have become extremely crowded and the idea of the Chinese government has to try to, to bud off some of these population centers and build entirely new cities under the idea of if you build it, they will come. And people are buying flats in those cities, but they're not living there yet. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of flats that are unoccupied, but I think that they will eventually be occupied. And the idea is that they're not full of people. I would say they're not full of people yet. Mm -hmm. Although historically there are other cases archaeologically where rulers have put together cities and you know, people stayed there for the ruler's lifetime and then as soon as the ruler passed away, everybody just you know, turned around and left. There are cities like that in India. There are cities like that in Egypt, like Amarna. Um, the idea of this command city uh, is not always enough to make it work. There's new capitals mm -hmm. in different, many post-colonial nations put up a new capital. Some of those are thriving, 
Others of them are, are not. They're almost the only kind of city I know that actually dies are the dynastic cities where we're going to have the capital of our dynasty here and everybody has to live where they say it's a command situation. And uh, often they're not in a convenient place like on a coast or somewhere in, in, in a land like Brasilia. Um, and those seem to be the only sort of built-in temporary cities are the ones that they, of course, the builders imagine, this is my legacy forever, but it's the opposite. Yes, and there are other kinds of places that function like cities that are not quite built up, and these are some of the very massive refugee camps um, that are also laid out in these very regular kinds of ways, and then around the edges there's this, the less organized kinds of settlements as new people are coming in and so on. I think there's some great studies to be done on those to see how it is that you have a kind of an instant city, actually. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's lots of studies on slums, which are incredibly dynamic and important. You've spent time in India and seen what it's like in Mumbai and so on. Uh, one thing I have read about ghost cities, and there's actually a book called Ghost Cities, about the Chinese ghost cities, and they are, they sort of perform the function like the slums of India, in a sense, except that the infrastructure and the apparatus and all that stuff is there, and then there's gradually infill. And there's lots of people in China, there's lots of people moving to opportunity, urban type opportunities. And so these ghost cities that are shocking when you see them, when they're first built, everything's new, but there's nobody there. Later on, there's people there. Um, and so, you know, it's, it starts out as a kind of a real estate scam and then becomes a real city anyway. What I, what I get is that cities find a way, one way or another, the urban thing is going to happen. Is that your sense? I would say that it's people who find a way. You know, okay. people, people who find an opportunity. And when you think about cities as places of people, there's, of course, there's the white-collar employment, and there's the blue-collar employment, but there's other things that pull cities together as well, and other things that people come to cities for. And one of the things that happen in cities is, of course, crime, because that's where the money is. So that's why you have crime in cities. But also, more soberingly, this is why homelessness is an urban problem, because that's where people can manage to survive, even if they have absolutely no other resources. So, you know, you don't think of homelessness as a rural problem. It is an urban problem for precisely that same reason. Um, question on climate change from Jack. Um, how's, so, a lot of cities are coastal. A lot of cities are on coasts that are not steep, like San Francisco or Seattle. They're on coasts that are pretty flat already, uh, especially in the developing world. And since we had a previous speaker, Jeff Goodell, the name of his talk is The Water Will Come. Yeah. And the water is already coming, it's going to keep coming, it's going to keep coming faster, it's not going to stop coming. Mm -hmm. How do these coastal cities and river cities, do you think, how's that going to play out for them? So the climate is not changing only right now. The climate has always been changing, right? So ever since the beginning of the Holocene, 10 to 12,000 years ago, the water level has been rising. The thing that's different about now is that the water level is rising more rapidly than it has in the prior 10 to 12,000 years. So the projection of rising water would be the case anyway if the Holocene was on its regular trajectory. What's happening is that now, practically within our lifetimes, we're going to be able to see the upward tick of that effect. And yet, flooding is something that cities have always had to deal with. And when you think about coastal cities, if you remember that map that showed you know, where, where all the biggest cities are, many of them are in coastal places where they have always been beset by typhoons and hurricanes and tidal waves. So that we should think about flooding as a kind of regular, long-term experience. The only thing that's different is that the rate of flooding will increase and mm -hmm. the frequency of flooding will increase. So I've recently been working on a, an academic paper on urban flooding and mm -hmm. appealing through archaeological site reports to look at evidence for flood deposits and things like that. And so the, the paper is provisionally titled, Urban Flooding is Normal. Uh, but I'm having trouble getting a traction with that. 
People want to think that every kind of disaster must be new to the 21st century. Um, it, it is either you know, comforting or you know, shoulder shrugging to think that it's well, always been there. You've done a lot of archaeology around the Mediterranean, and there are parts of the Mediterranean where you have to dive to do the dig. And um, nobody lives there now. <laughs> Uh, so say a little bit about how that played out and what kind of, you know, what was the time frame of these things going underwater and, um, and just what is it when a city actually drowns? Right, so the Roman world is one of the very best places to be able to think about ancient cities because there were so many of them and there's been so much archaeology in the Mediterranean region. And so some of the kinds of things that we think about like tectonics, are things that Roman cities very much had to deal with. I have a colleague, Jordan Pickett, who is working on the effect of earthquakes. And basically, earthquakes were a godsend to ancient Roman urban planners, because when the earthquake came, then they could get rid of that you know, old temple or administrative building or whatever it was. So the idea of never waste a good crisis is not new. The, the Romans were also practicing this. And, and they could also see the rather slow changes of, you know, aggradation and, you know, tectonic shifts and so on. And there are harbors in the Roman Mediterranean, multiple sites, where a harbor of the first century BC, a hundred years later, would be completely useless. They'd have to move the harbor um, or they'd have to, you know, create a new one. So people responding to Mother Nature in that dynamic way is also not new. We can actually see it in the archaeological record. Well, an interesting thing that emerged from Jeff Goodell's talk, which shocked me, is that he, uh, as you might imagine, spent a fair amount of time in Florida and New Jersey looking at the places where they're already getting what they call sunlight flooding, basically a king tide that fills the street and then fills the yard and sometimes fills the basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going and talking to people who've experienced that and asking, uh, are, you know, are you going to move? Uh, no, this is my home. Right. And th I thought that denial would be, a sort of climate change denial would be at the lowest among people most impacted, but in fact it's quite high among people most impacted. Is that some kind of urban phenomenon that, you know, here in the city we can do anything we want? Well, you know, there is that, that can-do sense uh, of optimism <laughs> in, in urban places, um, that the idea that people will, will overcome, that's what the hashtag, you know, name of city is strong is about, is that regardless of how awful the circumstance is, that people pull together. City strong is go ahead and have your climate change. We're just going to keep elevating Houston until the... You know, the idea of building a tell is something that worked for ancient people. You know, they were always trying to build a little higher than somebody else. Well, well, well. <laughs> I, I've, seen, I've seen the future, and it's a uh, uh, weird combination of denial and innovation, and everything's going to depend on pace. And, you know, the great thing we keep learning about cities, you point out, Jeffrey West points out in his book Scale, is cities are about moving fast. Mm -hmm. And as you say, we're, you know, we change the material of cities very rapidly compared to non-cities. And so I guess we'll just keep building ahead of whatever happens, is what you're saying. Yes, and in terms of you know, private homes, <clears throat> not having a basement is important. Of course, you cannot do that with a transportation system that's underground. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the kind of scale that works at the individual scale mm -hmm. is not something that works at the larger urban planning scale, which means that you need overarching civic thoughtfulness mm -hmm. about how to design systems that take into account these different kinds of natural or anthropologically, anthropogenically accelerated natural events. Well, one of the th points you made about the Fertile Crescent, where the original, in a sense, the first cities yeah. took shape, uh, is it was later referred to as the Fragile Crescent because of basically climate instability in that area. Mm -hmm. And how does the Fragile Crescent play out in terms of cities? So the idea of, you know, we all grew up with the Mesopotamia as the, the Fertile Crescent, you know, the hilly <coughs> flanks of the Fertile Crescent, which made, made it sound like it was this ideal place for a cities to come up. And then all the archaeologists who went to work there said, oh God, it's really hot, and it's like, there's, it's drought, and the farmers keep losing their crops, and it burns, and so on. This is not fertile, this is awful. Um, so it's a 
an archaeologist, Tony Wilkinson, and his group who came up with the idea with the fragile crescent. Ah, oh, now that's really interesting because it suggests that cities come up not in places that are really wonderful, but in cities, in places that have some kind of problem, right? So immediately you think of something like New Orleans. Right? New Orleans probably really ought not to still exist. Mm -hmm. But people just keep going back and mopping it up because it has something that overcomes that liability. Mm -hmm. So maybe cities thrive and survive because they are inherently dependent on creativity to exist at all. I think that's a really wild idea. You know, that, with all, that synergy of creativity is what makes cities persist. If you think about it, in the last thousand years, there is not a single city that has been abandoned, except for maybe Chernobyl. Right. And that, hmm, well, the, the fragility, for a while there's that sort of theory of hydraulic civilizations, uh, where, you know, control of flooding, like in Egypt, or managing you know, with canals and, and the, the managing of, of water provision uh, for the Middle Eastern cities, for places like uh, uh, in Cambodia, um, where do you, do you buy into the hydraulic theory of civilization? Well, you know, water and culture go together. They have to, okay. because without water, people can't live. Without water, people can't do agriculture. Mm -hmm. And it's really maddening, actually, to get at the, what came first, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got to dig down through all these levels and then hope that you hit the one spot that happened to be the earliest spot of a certain thing. So there's also an idea that you know, cities came first and then domestication came afterward. That's an old idea that Jane Jacobs had mm -hmm. that has been thoroughly dismantled by archaeologists. Okay. But there's a kernel of truth in the sense that cities accelerate mm -hmm. the production of agriculture in hinterlands because no one's going to grow grain, very few people are going to tend to animals in a city. You have to depend on that outlying mm -hmm. hinterlands. But those people in rural places have to simultaneously ramp up production to satisfy the urban market and watch their kids leave to go to the city. Mm -hmm. So there's this thing happening in rural places that we certainly see in the modern world, especially in you know, many developing countries where this happens in India a great deal. Uh, we live in a village uh, where we're working and yet you see nobody between the ages of about 10 and 60 because all of the people are working in cities. Mm -hmm. That has to have been the same in ancient cities as well. So mm. people in rural areas had to ramp up to produce, mm -hmm. innovate in terms of production, if some of that innovation also involved making canals and irrigation and reservoirs, then that was in response to the city, even though the domesticated plants and animals long predated urban life. Say more about Indian cities, because you've done some archaeology there, as I understand it, and most of us are not you know, sort of familiar with them. Egypt and the Middle East and so on, but the whole Indian early civilization is uh, an untold story. What do you find in cities there? So there were really two periods of urbanization in ancient India. One of them was the Bronze Age Harappan culture from about 2500 BC to about 1900 BC. And there was a handful of cities, uh, Harappa, Mohenjo-daro, you might have heard of, um, up and down the area of what's now Pakistan and Western India. Were and they also along the rivers, I assume? Yes, along the Indus River, um, but then also Dolavira, which is a site in India, was right on the ocean, or like on the run of Kutch, a big bay. Okay. And those cities survived and thrived for about 600 years, and then they sort of disintegrated. About a thousand years later, the idea of urbanism came back. Do we know why they might have disintegrated? Thank you. It seems to be a one-two punch. That's the thing that seems to get ancient cities, is that it's you know, some tectonic uplift and some migration that kind of overwhelms cities. But the Indus case is quite odd because the number of cities is relatively low. I think maybe the urban network was not strong enough to be absorbing moving populations, possibly. Say more about urban network for a minute, because that that's what you see starting around the 6th century BC. So after about a thousand years of not having anything that looked like cities, 
in the Indian subcontinent. All of a sudden, all up and down the Ganges, um, all throughout the peninsular subcontinent, you get cities, and you get a lot of them. There's probably about 100 settlements that we can say archaeologically are cities. And this is also the time of the beginning of Buddhism and Jainism. Um, it's a time when there's a lot of movement of people for pilgrimage and migration into cities. And that is a thriving urban network. Mm -hmm. And it continues right to the present day. And I suppose one of the things that's different now is it used to be that urban networks were regional. And you, know, you talk about the Pacific Rim as if it's a region. Now, well, that's you know, basically half the planet you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So it looks like network of cities is what totally global now, or and there's the talk of global cities. That, you know, there's certain finance, financial levels, and they intersect in a way in the global economies. They're global cities. Is that your sense of things? I think so. I mean, it, when you travel to other cities, you you know you come into a new city, even if it's a place or a country that you've never been before, you see many of the same things. You go from the airport, you go through some suburbs, you see high rises downtown with glass fronts, uh, you see some areas of very wealthy housing, you see some areas of slums, uh, you see all kinds of different jobs that people are doing and so on. You almost have to like rub your eyes and say, like, oh, wait. Where, where am I again? If you travel a lot, it's a common phenomenon. I, mm -hmm. Wait, which, which city am I in right now? Is it Bangkok, or Singapore, is it you know, Johannesburg, is it London? Um, you know, that is a kind of globalism that is, I think, driven by a, a sense of dynamism that is more than just national. Mm -hmm. it's, it's international. Well, one of the things you point out is that uh, and I refer to it, nations come and go and, and cities mm -hmm. persevere. Um, and y you make a further point, it almost doesn't matter what nation a city is in, it's just going to keep growing. What's that about? So cities have been extremely resilient over time. I and mean, we worry about cities being vulnerable or fragile, but actually cities are highly sustainable in the sense that they can always work their way out of a problem. And it's like having you know, your markets of food if you can't get apples from Belgium, they come in from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a way that cities reach out into these countrysides and, and bring things together. But they're also resilient because of those networks that they sustain amongst mm -hmm. themselves, with some exceptions. Now, you can never discount the leverage of the nation state, which is what keeps New Orleans alive, right? If it weren't for the feds pumping in lots of money because cities are too big to fail, then you, you might get an abandonment of someplace like New Orleans. Uh, interesting question from Julie Anderson. Please explain Phoenix. Please explain. <laughs> there's that. There's that sustainability thing. Not in the not in the sense that we often think about it as you know sustainability means being able to plan for a future where everybody gets what they need and so on. But sustainability in the sense that Phoenix is just sucking up all the resources that it possibly can. Mm -hmm. And it's drawing from an enormous hinterland. You know, just like Los Angeles is drawing mm -hmm. its water from the Sierras and from you, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, Phoenix is drawing water from, from all of us. And it, it started with an idea, and it just keeps going because it draws more people in, and the resources follow, and the technology follows, and people go to Phoenix for education, and for entertainment, mm -hmm. and for employment, and you know, for medical care, for all those other kinds of things. And it just, be it just becomes this upward spiral of growth against all common sense, one would suppose. There's your answer. Phoenix makes no sense. <laughs> uh, but that a, a city becomes its own reason, and this is sort of maybe the best argument I've heard for space colonies or even something on Mars, is that once you've got a city, it's smart enough and busy enough and energetic enough and able to draw on some kind of hinterland effects enough, it'll keep itself going no matter what. 
Yes, I mean, if you look at cities in places that are otherwise failed states, you know, a city like Kinshasa um, is growing and growing even though there is not a successful national integration. Um, you find cities like this in other parts of the world as mm -hmm. well, where the state is function, you know, absent or dysfunctional, um, but the city is there and it's because of those People, they come in because they have nothing in the countryside and maybe they can get something in the city. And maybe mm. that's, you know, small scale employment. You hear in a lot of places where someone who's qualified to be a school teacher or medical doctor migrates and mm. they become a street sweeper or they work in an office because it's better than the alternative, which is nothing. Which then raises the question of a city that, um is a city-state that manages without a nation wrapped around it. It is a nation. Singapore, Venice. Venice prospered in a chaotic Europe for 800 years. Mm -hmm. And Singapore looks incredibly stable, incredibly inventive, cut itself off basically from the nation of Malaysia and became its own nation. Is that the way to be a, a prospering city now? Is just get rid of uh, the nation around you? There are many ways to be a prospering city. Uh, it helps to be on a coast, I suppose. It helps to be on the coast. <laughs> right, if you remember the map of all the, the cities, think about the coastal cities. Um, you know, coasts are the place where the majority of urban residents live, hence the water problem, right? mm -hmm. hence the, the flooding problem. But those, that's because of shipping, yes? It's because of being able to... Th these coastal cities are coastal cities and river cities because ships could come and go to those places. Yes. And it's still the case that they it's count on ships It's still the case that shipping is the cheapest form of transportation. You know, an age-old technology for thousands mm. of years, and we are still totally dependent on it. Yeah. So once you invent shipping and you invent cities, you're going to have them, is what I hear. And then if you can add travel through the air, jet airplanes and so on, and travel through the... Uh, you know, through the infosphere with the internet and so on. All of these just add to cityness. They're just other ways to basically have these be centers of, of transport and trade and economic activity. Exactly, and even in the modern world where we think that perhaps we could get rid of cities or have an alternative through tech, right? So the idea of being able to work from any place it's very interesting to, to think about where tech companies want to be. You know, they, they don't want to be out in the middle of Kansas someplace, even though they could. If they want to be in San Francisco, they want to be in Seattle, um, they want to be in those places where their employees can access the education, the entertainment, the employment, the other opportunities that go along with being a city. So Jeffrey West, when you talk about cities getting faster and that they're they create problems, but they're so innovative they can solve problems faster than they create them. And they then solve problems for, in a sense, everybody. And it's part of what you ask cities to do. And then he says, but this obviously can't go on forever. Cities just can't keep on growing. Even though they get better and faster and more prosperous, the bigger they get, they've got to stop somewhere. And I say, okay, what's your data on that? And it doesn't exist yet. Do you think cities will just keep growing because of these advantages? There doesn't seem to be a natural upward stopping point for urbanism. In fact, one of the things that's really interesting is that it was said <coughs> relatively recently that half of the world's population is living in cities. And I just looked up some new data, and it's 55% now. So you know where the trend is going. Right. Toward 80%, people think, because some of the nations that are already sort of saturated, like I think you said that or oh, Britain, 92% urban or something right. like that. Right. Um, and much of Latin America actually for a very long time has been about 80% urban, which itself is a, an anomaly that one wants to find out more about. Um, nevertheless, it looks like it's not only urbanity forever, but it's urbanity more and more and more powerful. Uh, does that level off at some point, do you think, or what are we looking at? There's always going to be a rural component. You know, urban centers and rural places need each other. Uh, I think that's an important thing to, to think about in current parlance. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the proportion of people living in cities is likely to increase. And the idea of creating new cities, and not only the cities we already have, the 4,000 that we already have on the planet, but I was recently reading a very interesting assessment of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Apparently the Ethiopian government has proposed 100 new cities for Ethiopia. So it means that the idea of creating urban places mm -hmm. is not something that's just being left to happenstance or you know, individual communities and desires and things like that, but viewing urbanism as a positive momentum mm. for national growth and identity, I think is, is really an amazing Do you think you're paying attention about. to Chinese in that? Because China is building cities on purpose more than anybody. And it sounds like you're suggesting some other developing countries are saying, okay, that's the way to do things, we'll do that too. Is that, do you think, what's happening? It's certainly possible. I mean, urbanism is a very desirable, middle-class, affirming kind of structure. And one mm -hmm. of the things I talk about in the book is that urbanism and the middle class grew up together. Before you had cities, you didn't need middle managers, you didn't need accountants, you didn't need people to keep track of laborers. But when you started to have larger and larger enterprises in cities, mm -hmm. then you needed someone to keep track of all that stuff. Those people needed education. The education is often signaled by credentials, like diplomas. And so that's how urbanism, education, the middle class, production, consumption, all kind of gets tied together in the same you know, physical package. So it looks like language was before cities, but writing and accounting and then eventually money were city creations, yes? Yes, exactly. So the first writing comes along in Mesopotamia shortly after the beginnings of cities. Um, the first money is really interesting because there were perfectly viable cities all over the world without coined money. Uh, money is actually a very late invention. So, you know, a very sophisticated barter system, um, that kind of expectations, that social network that had to do with money and not just conversation is something that also goes way back in urbanism. So, you wrote your city's book. <laughs> uh, do you still do archaeology or do you mainly a writer now. Oh my goodness, I still do archaeology. I was in the field in January and February with my Indian colleagues uh, looking at actually a hinterland settlement. We've been very mm. fortunate that uh, my colleague R.K. Mahanti and I started with the, the big urban center and we've sort of been working our way backwards. Uh, oftentimes what happens, archaeologists start working at small centers and they think that someday they might get a chance to work in the big city. We were extremely lucky in being able to start with the big city first. Mm -hmm. And we've worked our way <coughs> backwards. And in looking at smaller settlements and town-sized sites, we really see that, that pull of the urban center because when we were excavating at the city of Shishpalgar, we would find lots of little you know, consumer trinkets and lots and lots of trash and things like that. And then out in the rural settlements, you know, there was much less of that excess and abundance of consumerism. And you just got the sense that the young people especially, you know, as soon as the big city came up with its big fortification wall and monumental architecture and everything, I think the kids just, left the farm and, and went <laughs> to the big city. That was it. So is it the case, I mean, one of the things that fascinates me about the Mideast is you have these tells, these mountains basically that with the city on top, that the mountain was made by the city's trash accumulating and, and uh, you know, the old uh, mud brick place is kind of decaying, screw it, just build another mud brick place on top of it and then that becomes part of the hill. Um, that, mode of city building, <laughs> but then the water has to go uphill toward money as usual. Uh, how does that actually play out and should it play out more now that we're trying to stay ahead of flooding? You know, it's a very low tech solution. You know, building higher means that you're up out of the water and sometimes it doesn't take very much. You know, mm -hmm. if you're talking about, you know, tidal fluctuations, um, you know, putting a building on a plinth is an age-old architectural solution that we see over and over again in different parts of the world. So it does work. Just keep layering up ahead of the water. That's right. I like that. Let's call out a night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.